Welcome to Women With Drive, a podcast from the Deakin Melbourne Boomers, talking all things women's hoops. Hosted by Boomer's own, Lou Brown. Hi everyone, and welcome back to a, another episode of Women With Drive, a podcast brought to you by the Deakin Melbourne Boomers. I'm your host, Lou Brown, and today I'm here with an absolute icon in the world of sports broadcasting. I would like to give a huge welcome, direct from the USA, ESPN reporter and play-by-play commentator, Holly Rowe. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me today, Holly. I know it's early where you are, it's late night here, but... We're just, I'm just super thankful that Lauren Jackson herself was able to connect us. Uh, and before we jump into talking more about you and, and your career, uh, what an amazing weekend for Lauren Jackson with her induction into the Naismith Hall of Fame. Uh, what are your reflections on LJ and the impact that she has had on the WNBA? Well, first of all, she reached out to me and said, hey, can you do me a big favor and do this podcast? And I'm like, are you kidding me? If you ask me to do anything, of course I'm doing it. So, so stop. <laughs> um, so I'm really honored to be on here, and I'm even more honored that she asked me to be on here with you guys. Um, it means a lot to me because I got to cover her through the majority of her career in the WNBA, and I just loved her game, uh, loved her as a competitor, as a person. And it's been really fun to see her kind of, um, as she's left the game, kind of grow up and become this executive and mother and all the other things that she has become. So it's really precious to me to see this journey for Lauren. Um, she's had a big month. I actually went to the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame last month. Or I guess it was three weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago where she was also inducted alongside Tamika Catching, Swin Cash, a lot of other famous coaches. So she's now been inducted to the two biggest basketball Hall of Fames in, in our country anyway, and I would argue maybe the world. And um, it's really huge for Lauren because sometimes, you know, you come from Australia, you're the kind of the first on the scene to make a huge splash, although Michelle Timms was kind of my OG Australian favorite player in the WNBA. Shout out to Lindsay. I love Kimsey. She was, I loved her game. But, um, you know, Lauren was really kind of the first MVP, the first champion that was playing at such a high level. And I just think it's really special. I wish she could have come and, and been here. When I was at the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame, Lynn Dunn, her former coach, uh, d- gave her induction speech. And then I just know because you guys are all on lockdown still, uh, she wasn't able to be there and travel. But I hope she understands what a big deal it is and how we have been celebrating her here in the United States. I mean, it's been a really big deal over here. She's on you know, ESPN, all the news channels, they're doing all these social media posts for her, like remembering her game. And yeah, she was just named also to the top 25 list of um, the best 25 players ever in the WNBA. So it's been a big weekend. It's really fun to remember her and, and kind of go down memory lane, thinking of the greatness of Lauren Jackson. No, I, I agree. And it's, there's uh, love to hear that there's been so much buzz around it in the US as well, because obviously Basketball Australia here has just been so excited for her uh, having the first basketball player inducted. I know we had Lindsay Gaze inducted in 2015 as a coach as well. So just we're super excited. And I just love hearing that from you as well. Uh, but now, Holly, to turn to you. You were born in Utah, completed your studies there in broadcast journalism. You have one son. Uh, and to dive into your career a little bit, so just bear with me, I'm going to list out a couple of things here. <laughs> you have been a reporter broadcaster at ABC and ESPN for over 25 years, uh, a sports commentator and broadcaster for some of the most high profile sporting events in leagues in America and arguably the world as well, uh, including men's and women's college basketball, the women's final four, the WNBA, Saturday night college football. Uh, Your talent covers a range of sports, including basketball, American football, softball, volleyball, I know indoor and beach and gymnastics, and I know there's more sports out there as well, but nominated in 2015 for an Emmy for the Most Outstanding Sports Personality. You are a producer and a writer for documentaries, but maybe highlight of them of them all, uh, a cancer survivor and and a huge advocate for research and prevention, which we'll dive into a little bit more uh, later. So we'll start with broadcasting to begin with. Uh, Holly, where did your drive to become a sports broadcaster come from? 
Well, where did it start? I don't really know. I just know that ever since I was a little kid, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was in the fifth grade here in our U.S. elementary school, and they made us do this test where you say, do you like this? Do you like this? Do you like this? Maybe you'll be a good nurse. Maybe you'll be a good teacher. And I just remember raising my hand and telling the teacher, my job is not on here. I want to be a sports reporter and it's not on this sheet. What's happening? So I just had this very clear vision as a kid what I wanted to do. And probably my my drive comes from I'm just obsessed with sports. Like I I, I don't exactly know why that happened. My dad took us to a lot of sports. Um, we played a lot of sports as a family growing up. And unfortunately, you know, like I'm short chunky person. I'm not the athlete. You know, I was not gifted that way, but I played everything growing up. So maybe I just like admire the people who go on to be professional athletes and and are doing it at a high level. And I'm I'm in such great admiration. Maybe that's part of it, but just a passion for sports. Like I, this weekend I did a college football game, a WNBA game. And then I went to a softball game as a fan all in 24 hours. So I'm just like obsessed with sports. I don't know how to describe and you, it. You did college game day, yeah. right? Did college football yeah. College game so Iowa, true, yeah. And then I flew to uh, Chicago the next morning. I did the Chicago Sky versus the Washington Mystics. And then oh as soon gosh. as the game was over, I drove out and went to an AU softball event, um, pro softball event here in the U.S. So it was really cool. Yeah, that is impressive. I mean, you've been in the game for 25 years, and I'm sure it always hasn't been easy for you, especially being a woman in the industry. If you were to go, if you're going to give one piece of advice to a, a younger Holly Rowe looking for a career in sports broadcasting, uh, what would that be? Ooh, what would my one piece of advice be? Um, be be creative and think outside the box because I think young people coming up now and Lou, you and I have talked about this. I came and did a media training session at Tennessee and 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 we talked about you know you, you don't just walk in and get the job that you want anywhere. You have to figure out ways to get experience, to become good at your craft, to get those reps that you need. And so for me, it was I did a time by on a radio station in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I put the very first women's basketball game ever on the on the radio in Utah. And the reason I did that, and I went out and sold the advertising time myself, um, was so that I could have the opportunity to be the announcer because no one was doing the women's events. And so I started out really young in my career looking for opportunity of where could I fit in and get repetitions. So I was pretty Major excited. Major Yeah. Yeah, incredible. Um, I read a little bit where you spoke about a, a life mantra that you have adopted. And it was a quote that was shared to you by a legendary football coach by the name of Frosty Westering. And that was make the big time where you are. So you're not always chasing the big time. I, I really like this. And I was just hoping you could share what that meant to you and how you kind of live out this mantra and what you do. Right. I, I think that mantra really hit me because, you know, he said, if you make the big time where you are, right here in this moment, then you're really present and you're really focused and locked in in what you're doing and you're also enjoying it. So he was a division three football coach, which is kind of the lowest division here in the US. No scholarships, you know, not a high level of attention on them. And he coached there his whole career. And, and so he made the big time where he was and he ended up winning a national championship and being one of the most successful coaches ever. He told me that back in like 1999, 2000, and it just stuck with me because I think I see so many people, and, and Lou, maybe you are like this too, where everyone's chasing the big time. Well, I'll be happy when I can get that next job, that next promotion, that next contract, that next higher level team, or that next MVP, I'll, you know, then I'll be happy. And I just think it's been a really good lesson of, you no, know, I'm going to be happy now doing what I'm doing right this second, because this is the big time where I am right now. No, and you absolutely are in the big time, especially with, we're here to talk a little bit of women's basketball, but women's basketball in particular. But I just, I think that bit of advice is, is very prevalent to the society that we live in today when, you know, you're always trying to chase something that is online, social media that may not be within your depth. Women with drive. We'll get to talking a little bit about basketball just in a bit, but before we do, you have been public in your fight with cancer and a wonderful advocate for cancer research and treatment. 
You were first diagnosed in 2015 with desmoplastic melanoma, which is a very rare and aggressive form of skin cancer. Uh, can you share with us some of your journey with cancer and how it has impacted your life? Yes, I'm glad you asked me about this because, you know, people in Australia, this is something you would need to be very aware of. I, you know, was that dumb young girl that would go tan. I would, I would go to tanning beds. You know, you just wanted to be tan. And I got just a spot on my chest and I went in to see if they could take it off or, um and they did a biopsy and it ended up being this very rare form of cancer. And at the time I thought, oh, it's no big deal. They'll just cut it off. I'll be fine. And I was very cocky about it. And it ended up spreading to my lymph nodes in my right armpit. Um, I had a big tumor there. They had to totally reconstruct my whole upper body, take that out. Then it spread into my lungs. And then I was like in the fight for my life. And so I didn't really know that melanoma could spread into your organs. It can go to your brain. It can go all through your body. And I think that the, those of us who love the sun, and I know Aussies are, are in that category, were just naive. I, I had no idea that skin cancer could kill me and that could be so deadly. So it's been a really tough challenge. You know, I was in chemotherapy um, every 21 days for three years. And that's really hard. You know, my body's just now recovering, but I'm doing well now. Um, my tumors are disappearing through this great immunotherapy that we have. But I guess my message is just please cover up in the sun. I had no idea that it could kill us, but it's deadlier now than it's ever been. And for young women, um, young, even young men that might be listening to this, one time in a tanning bed can give you a 50% chance to get melanoma. And um, so it, it's just... I keep seeing all my young WNBA players out tanning and at the pool. And I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I could just tell you what's going to happen in 20 years to you, you know? So be careful, everybody. Yeah, I think it's huge advice. But I'm just so glad to hear that you're doing so well now and you're healthy and hopefully something that is behind you. But I agree, it's very prevalent here in Australia in skin cancer. And uh, my mom, she's had a melanoma as well. Oh. So it's kind of been through my family a little bit. So I know a little bit about it, but um, your story was was very huge. And I think it's hopefully a bit of a reality check for some people as well. Just as you said, can be very naive. And I think I have been myself. So definitely I'm out there sunscreening now. Yeah, and it <laughs> because means, of like, people like yourself a, and my mom. You can have a genetic component to that too if your mom's had it. So you've got to be very careful. Yes. And then the other thing I learned through all this is like all of us have something that we're like, oh, I wonder if that, oh, I wonder if I should. So my other new thing is when in doubt, check it out. Like go get it checked. Because the best thing is they just say, oh, it's nothing, you know, or oh, we'll just take that off. That's, you know, the best case scenario. So don't procrastinate. And you guys have been in lockdown. Yeah. So I'm worried that people procrastinated, <laughs> you know, getting stuff checked. So please go and you know, get yes. stuff checked. No, I love that. When in doubt, check it out. That is a great motto. Great motto. Um, a part of what you talked about publicly is how you were still working and broadcasting games and use that as very powerful medicine. Can you tell me more about what drove you to keep working through your treatment and how that helped you, but also how was that time for you? You know, I look back on that time and I'm like, man, what a nut job. Like, why did I just keep thinking I had to work all the time? You know, like most people get cancer or get sick and they stay home or whatever. But for me, I felt like I had to have little goals of, okay, I've got to get well enough so I can go cover this game. I've got to get well enough to be back in time for college football season. So it kind of was a way for me to set little goals for myself of, for survival. Um, like I just had to keep going and, and moving forward so that I didn't just cave in, you know, I think sometimes you can cave in mentally and emotionally when you have a tough diagnosis. So for me, it was a survival mechanism, but also I had this really intriguing moment where, um, one day at a, at a visit with my doctor, he said to me, you need to start thinking about how you're spending your time. And that was his very pleasant way of saying, we're not sure how this is going. We're not sure if you're going to make it, you know, because tumors in your lungs that are inoperable are deadly. And, um, you know, that just like hit me, that just hit me in the face. And I was like, oh, wow, I, I don't think I ever thought I was going to die from this. You know, like it just shocked me. And so I went home that day and I sat on my couch and I just closed my eyes and I just tried to imagine, like, what would I want my life to be like if I didn't have much time left to live? Like, what was my bucket list or what was my passion or whatever? And I, what I came to realize is I'm living my life exactly like that. 
I, I was already doing the things. Now, maybe I would do more fun things or more um, silly bucket list types of things. Um, and, and I did. So like I had always wanted to move and live in New York City. And so I went and did that. Um, I wanted to learn to play the piano again. So I played the piano and got in a little band, a girl band, and we had a little concert. And, you know, so I did some bucket list things like that. But my true passion was my son hanging out with my family and going to games. And that's so that's what I did to keep going and how I spent my time when I wasn't sure how much time I would have left. And, you know, thank God this immunotherapy is shrinking these tumors. And, you know, I'm just really blessed to have more time. But it, it's a sobering thing of like, how are you spending your time in life? Make sure it's what you love doing passionately. And then I also learned like every single day, you should have some joyful moment where you are like stopping and like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Um, and so I started keeping a little joy journal of what, what was bringing me joy every day. And that kind of changed my outlook as well. Yeah, I love that. We're in lockdown now. So I think that's also a huge message we could take kind of seeing what what can we do right. rather than what, what can't we do. Uh, I know you have connected with a lot of others as well, and in particular, a couple of athletes. I know you met Tiana uh, Mangakahia as well, who battled breast, breast cancer. Uh, why is it important to you to connect with others, maybe going through a similar journey? Well, it's really intriguing story with Tiana because, um, you know, obviously I heard that she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer, and I was just shocked that such a young, you know, athletic woman could have breast cancer, which is sobering. And so I actually reached out to her on social media and their uh, basketball folks put me in touch with her. And we just been, became friends through like Instagram. It was such a funny, weird thing. And then last, uh, this past March, I finally got to see her in person and play in person. And it just meant a lot to me. Um, you know, we both started crying and just hugged each other because I think you bond with people who are going through something similar. You know, no one can understand um, how scary it is, how frightening it is, and how horrible you feel after chemo, like just all the terrors of, of having cancer, except for other people who are going through it. And so I just feel like it's this bond. And oh gosh, I'll get musty talking about it. But for me to come and see her play in person, um, you know, her last game in college, I got to be right there watching her play, covering her game. And it meant a lot to me because she and I had been on this full circle journey together for, for several years. And, and for me to be there courtside covering her game, it was just, it was precious. And I know after that game, she was very emotional and said, you know, I'm not the player I used to be. And I think it's been really hard for her to not be who she used to be, like not be normal again. Um, but, but what I say to her is she's alive and, and that's what is important and that's what matters. And once you've gone through this journey with cancer, you'll never be the same. Um, and so, you know, learning to love your new normal is hard. Um, you know, I've got all these scars. I've got this weird issue. Like, I can't find shirts that, fit. you know, like there's all these weird things that people on the outside never see um, that we struggle with from, from all of our cancer problems. But um, I just want her to be joyful and, and love that she's alive and living and loving. And I know she is. Yeah, well, I just think that two amazing women, uh, I can't even imagine, begin to imagine what either of you guys have, have had to battle, but you guys are huge role models and I love your story. It is such an inspiration to so many. Uh, I can, as I said, I can only imagine. Women with drive. It's been 10 years since we won a championship. We've been so close. She misses as well. Towns will hang on. This year, it's our time. This year, we're back. Georgia puts it in. The dagger of quarter time. In Melbourne, in front of you, our fans. You bring the energy. You bring the noise. You bring the passion. We'll bring the game. We'll bring the boom. We're your team, Melbourne. Let's do this. Uh, you've been covering the WNBA for, again, over 20 years. Uh, and in the past two years, it seems to have been so significant in the growth and profile of the WNBA, not just in the USA, but also internationally. Uh, this including you know, increase in pay, broadcast coverage and profiling, uh, more profile of the athletes. Obviously, I believe there's still so much more to go, but what are your reflections on the growth and the key factors that have been driving this? 
Well, first and foremost, I think people forget the basketball is good, right? So like the number one thing is the high level of talent. The women are better than ever. The game is better than ever. It's fast. It's athletic. They can shoot. They're skilled. They're fundamental. I just think it's really beautiful basketball. Um, and number two, I feel like it's like people have opened their eyes and we're having kind of this wave of inclusive th thinking where we are opening our eyes to, gosh, why, why have people been negative about that? And I, I just think that the time is right. Um, if you really look back in history, it took the NBA um, 25 years to really gain traction and, and become what it is today. And we're right at 25 years with the WNBA. So. Yeah. so I feel like it's this tipping point, right, of like, oh, it's finally people appreciating it instead of fighting back against it. And, you know, there's so many great Australian players who've come through, you know, Sandy Brondello, Michelle Timms are a few that I've talked about. Leilani Mitchell, shout out to my fellow Utah Ute, um, who's been so good. Uh, there's so Alana Smith, you know, I can name Ezzy Magbagor. There's so many kids in the WNBA right now that are so good. Um, and I hope that some of that trickled down. I started following when I was in the bubble last year, I did a podcast with Megan Husway. I hope I'm saying her last name right. And, and so I got to be kind of like Instagram friends with her. And so now I'm really following the WNBL a little bit closer um, and following what happens when people go home to Australia to play, you know, because a lot of people left straight from the WNBA bubble and then went to Australia to that bubble. And it was a challenge for those people. And um, so I paid really close attention to that and I've been getting way more into it. But I just think the time is right. People are um, not so sexist towards women. I think we're all trying to um, uplift and accommodate black women more. And, and shine a light on their beauty and strength and, and, you know, spectacular beings. And I just, I don't know, the timing just feels right to be a little more open, a little more accepting and a little more loving. And then I also think the thing that happened in the WNBA bubble is we saw what leaders these women are. I mean, they flipped the U S Senate. I don't know if you guys in Australia and understand they supported a candidate in the Georgia Senate election that changed the balance of power in the Senate for voting in the United States Congress um, and government. So, you know, the WNBA women have figured out that when we are collective and use our voices together, we're, we're pretty strong. And it's really been beautiful to watch. That has a, a WNBA has created such a platform and then so many players that have found their voices and using them for change and equality in such a positive way. It is uh, such huge role models within the WNBA for so many in the younger generation. Um, and as we mentioned, there's a lot of Australian players that have a great legacy in the WNBA. And we have a couple of WNBA players coming to the Melbourne Boomers as well in Lindsay Allen and Tiffany Mitchell with Indiana Fever, so we're super excited to get them over here as well. But, uh, you know, some of the Australian greats, we have, you mentioned Michelle Timms, we have Penny Taylor. Oh, Penny uh, Taylor, I miss she. Penny Taylor's a huge one. Please don't let me miss Penny. <laughs> uh, she is absolutely, no one played harder. It, no one played harder. I mean, she and Tamika Catchings, I would say, are the two players that played the hardest I've ever seen in my life. And not only that, she's just a beautiful, spectacular human um, a Penny Taylor is like one of my all-time favorites ever in the WNBA, regardless of <laughs> Australian or American. And, um, you know, I got to cover her. I got to do her last game. She played in. And it was very special. Um, no, I, I, please do not let me forget Penny because she, you know, <laughs> I forget not, she's not. here in the U.S. I think maybe that's why my brain. Yeah. That. As I, when we talk about the greats, I had to, I had to speak her name. She's a huge role model of mine growing up. We played at the same junior club. So I'm always like, I played with other inspectors. Yes. Same as Penny Taylor. <laughs> I love Penny. And uh, then Ezzy. Then I, I talk about sorry, Ezzy, Ezzy yes. I picture up here. So Ezzy Magbagor, um, I just met her last year for the first time, and she's playing with the Seattle Storm. And oh my gosh, I like, I don't know how to say it right, but like baby greatness, I, I guess like she's so young, you know, I think she just turned yeah, baby go to 20, 21 years old, but the game is there and she is just going to keep blossoming and blossoming. And I already see her doing stuff with her frame in the WNBA. I mean, last year in the bubble, there were a couple of plays because, you know, it was really quiet in there. There's no one in there. I'm the only media person in there. And I would just like gasp out loud, like, oh, you know, you know, and I'm like, oh my gosh, Ezzy. 
So she's really growing. Even this year, I can see the strides she made from year one to year two. And honestly, the only limitation I see right now, and I've, I talked to her a little bit about it, is just staying on the floor. She's very physical, and she gets into foul trouble sometimes. So just learning to play um, in the WNBA with that physicality, but without getting called for fouls. Like, that's her next step to, to greatness. But gosh, she's fantastic. She is. I'm I'm super excited to play with her. Uh, so you have to make sure you tune into a couple of our our games I this season. I will. I want it as soon as, <laughs> as soon as this pandemic's over. I'm coming to Australia. I you have to. I got obsessed during the stay home lockdown quarantine with Australian TV. I found this app, and so I was watching all <laughs> the Australian shows. And then um, when our election was going on, I was like, okay, if a certain person gets elected again, I'm fleeing the country. I just can't take it anymore. <laughs> And I looked at property in Australia, so you have a <laughs> and don't be shocked if you um, look up and see me at one of your games next year. No, we absolutely love that. I know we would take very great care of you here. Oh, uh, so <laughs> you would have to worry about that. Uh, but finally, the WNBA playoffs are right around the corner. Aces, Suns, and Storm are looking strong. Phoenix have the big three uh, in. Diggins, uh, Brittany Griner, and then Tarossi, hopefully she's back playing. Um, but what are your predictions on to who may make that cha championship run? Well, the team that looks the best right now and is the number one overall seed, which is a double bye, is the Connecticut Sun. And if you remember back in 2019, you know, they were just a couple of points away from winning the WNB championship. It went to five games against the Washington Mystics. A really hard fought game five, Eleni Deladon and the, the Mystics came out on top. But the Sun have been right there. And, um, you know, last year was a tough one for them in the bubble. They did make it into the playoffs in advance. Alyssa Thomas was a beast for them. But Jonquil Jones, a player from the Bahamas, keep your eye on Jonquil. She is playing the best. I think she's probably going to end up being the MVP of the WNBA this year. And they are on a mission. They have this window of this young group that's kind of grown up together and, and this championship window. And they have a sense of urgency that is just, you can feel it. So I would say that the Sun right now are the favorite. You know, the Aces, I would have said, are the favorite. But, you know, Liz Cambage has been out. She's been kind of up and down uh, with her contributions. And that changes their team a little bit. Um, they're playing very well. They have moments of greatness, but I just think Connecticut looks a little better right now. And then the the other question mark out there is Phoenix and Seattle. You know, a lot of this depends on the health of both teams. So Diana Trazzi's out right now with an ankle injury, and Brianna Stewart's out with a foot injury. Maybe um, an Achilles soreness is something that I'm hearing. And so who's healthy? You know, it's been a long season. The Olympic break was really long and difficult for everybody. So who's healthy um, and playing their best basketball? And right now it's Connecticut Sun and Las Vegas Aces, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I hope, you know, they, they get healthy and can bring the best the best teams to WNBA playoffs. But regardless, it's, it's going to be super exciting. So uh, thank you, Holly. Uh, it has been such an honor. I can't thank you enough for taking the time this morning to be here and chatting with me on Women With Drive. I love watching you and learning from you. So now to be able to pick your brain a little bit has just been super awesome, especially in this light. So good luck in the coming weeks. And we look forward to watching as the WNBA playoffs unfold. Well, thank you for having me. And I just want to say I'm so proud of you because we did oh, a media you. training session together. Was it two or three we years did. ago? I don't, know. I, don't know. I don't want to say I don't want to say three, but I think three. Like yeah. But you and I did that, and um, you know we did practice interviews, and we talked about we how to be a good media person. And so I just want to say I'm very proud of you. Look at you. You've come so oh, far, you. and this has been a blast. Thank you for having me, and yes. thank you to your great organization. I know the Boomers are like just a legendary franchise there in Australia. So my goal in life, my bucket list goal in life, is come to Australia and, and come to a game. No, we, we're going to make this happen for sure. But thank you so much, kind words. Really, really warm for me. Maybe feel really good then. So. <laughs> uh, but good luck. As I said, good luck. So, But uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to and Women With Drive. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I will see you next week where I'll have a chance to chat with Melbourne Boomers' own recent first-time Olympian and able about to enter her second WNBA playoff campaign with Seattle Storm, Ezzy Magbagor. 
Thanks for listening to Women With Drive, hosted by Lou Brown. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and if you could, leave us a review.